again to another edition of Digging Deeper. Uh, it is so good to be with you as always, and I hope that you've been having a great week. Hope that things are going well, and that we are hurtling toward Christmas here. We continue to move closer and closer toward the end of the year, and what that means is that uh, around Christmas time or the, the weeks of Christmas and New Year's, uh, I think those are the, the last couple Sundays in the, uh, in, in the month, or maybe the first is on a Sunday. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll be taking a hiatus for a couple weeks there right in the thick of the holidays, but up until then, we will try to continue to uh, do some of these. Now, I realize that many of you, if you're using this in a group context, which I hope you are, um, have not been uh, using those these lately or haven't been maybe meeting as a group lately, and that's just a function of the busy time, this busy time of the year, and with so much going on, totally understand that. But uh, we, will, uh, we will get back rolling with a lot of our groups in January and uh, as we move into the new year. So <clears throat> right now, we may not uh, meet, may not be watching these as groups as much. Maybe uh, some of you are watching them individually. If that's the case, wonderful. And I'm so glad that you're uh, along with us for this, this opportunity to go a little bit deeper with what uh, was taught on Sunday morning. So we've started a new series now here at LifePoint, and the new series is, uh, is really a Christmas series. It's a mini-series. Not, not real long, but uh, we've concluded the, the series about uh, the, the armor of God, and so we've moved into uh, this Christmas season. And uh, uh, today we're talking about the topic of God's love for us and the significance of that and how that impacts our lives. It's an incredibly important topic, and there's so much that could be said there. But we're going we're gonna to delve into that a little bit farther than we were able to on Sunday morning. And uh, I hope this has been a help. Now, these first three questions, as always, uh, that I'm going to ask are questions that are just based around your perceptions and your response to the message. And so there is nothing um, that is that is requires technical knowledge with these. There's nothing that requires you to be an expert on the Bible or anything of that nature. In fact, if you know your own opinion, that's all you need for these. These first three questions are just your reactions to the message from Sunday. And so let me ask those and that what this does, these questions get, get, get folks talking uh, and help, uh, help foster some communication is at the beginning of the group. So first question is this, what did you like in the message? What did you like in the message? Was there something that you particularly uh, enjoyed from this message that, uh, that you, you thought was, was really meaningful to you? Take a moment and share that with your group. If you're doing this in a group or just think about it if you're an individual because it's always good to revisit what was in the message. Our lives are so busy that sometimes uh, everything going on just drowns out uh, what we've learned. And so uh, take a moment and think, either think about it if you're an individual or if you're in a group, discuss. Uh, what did you like in the message? Share that with each other. All right, second question here is what do you did you disagree with in the message? What did you disagree with in the message? And maybe there wasn't anything that you uh, exactly disagreed with that you thought was, was totally wrong, but maybe there's something that you weren't clear on. Maybe there's something you were confused about a little bit. So if that's the case, uh, take a moment and uh, and discuss that. Maybe you'll find some clarity from other people in your group or, or try to think through that a little bit on your own. What was it that you disagreed with or what was it that you struggled with to understand in the message. Share that uh, in, in your group and uh, see what you come up with. All right, third question here is, what do you remember the most from the message? What do you remember the most from the message? Was there something that was particularly meaningful, something that really stuck out to you, uh, something that you, you think you're gonna remember for a while? Uh, what was it that you took away? Maybe that's a good way of saying it. What was it something that you took away from the message? So take a moment and discuss that as a group. Uh, share that with each other. What was the, what was your takeaway from the message? And uh, take take a minute to discuss that or think through that, and we'll be back in a moment. All right, and uh, now we're going to get into these first couple questions. They're kind of introductory questions to get us. Uh, discussing uh, the topic at hand. And so here's the first question. And this is, seems like a simple question, but it's really not. There's a lot to it. 
How would you define love? How would you define love? Take a moment and discuss it. Uh, pause the video here as I give you a moment to, to pause the video and discuss that as a group or think through that or scribble down and scribble down your thoughts on a piece of paper. Um, how would you define love? Take a moment and discuss that. All right, now that is one of those words we use all the time and seldom probably take uh, a moment to think about, well, what does that really mean? What does it mean uh, to love? Uh, what, what is the significance of love? So, um, you know, I wrote, I looked in the dictionary because I, I was really at a loss to try to define love. You, you just know it when you, when you encounter it, it's hard to, hard to define. It's a, it's a tricky word. But I, I uh, found in the dictionary that it's an intense feeling of deep affection, an, atten an intense feeling of deep affection. So it, there, uh, the dictionary defines it in terms of the feeling, uh, or the feelings that go along with it. Now, the Greek language is not always, which is what the New Testament was written in, uh, which is uh, what uh, the message, the, the passage in John that was used for the message was from and the gospel account that I uh, is in the message. Those uh, are were written originally in Greek, and so in Greek, not only always was Greek more te is Greek more precise and technical than English, but in certain situations it is. And the Greeks had um, different words for love. We just we glob all our definition or all all our. Um, definitions, I guess, of love into, into one word. And so I'll say, I love my peanut butter and jelly. I love my children. Uh, I love my wife. I love, uh, I love Alabama football, whatever it is. And uh, we just use that word kind of loosely and it covers all kinds of terrain. Well, in the Greek language, there was different types of love. And so they had to mention, well, I think there was actually four, but three that are mentioned in the New Testament. Um, eros, philos, and uh, philos, and uh, and agape were the three uh, that were there, and then there was also another another one called storge, but uh, which referred to family uh, love within a family. But um, er let me let me just break those down real real quickly here for you. Uh, eros is is romantic love or uh, a, a physical attraction type of love. Uh, that was that was the love, and this word we get erotic from. It's we get other other words uh, from that, and so this this idea of eros is the idea of romantic love, and so the Greeks would use the word eros in reference to uh, a romantic type of love, and then you had uh, philos uh, love, which is a, a love between um, between people, like a friendship love. Uh, just a, uh, a brotherly love. In fact, you have the, the city called Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia uh, literally means the city of brotherly love. It's it's the type of um, it's a type of love that is that is between uh, between friends or affiliates. It's 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 a, a a love that is a friendship type of love. And then there is a agape love. And agape love is really that distinctive word that shows up again and again in the uh, New Testament, and it is really a reference to the love that God has shown to us, and it's the love that, by extension, believers in Jesus are supposed to show to each other. And so agape love is the type of love that is a giving love. It is a love that looks out for the other person, not for itself. And uh, it, it, it seeks the other person's benefit. And so that is, uh, that is agape love. And that is really what we're going to be focusing on, uh, what, we've, what, what has been focused on in this message. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that. Second question here is, what impact do you think love has on a person? What impact do you think love has on a person? Take a moment and discuss that as a group. Think through that. Pause the video here. All right. Well, I, I don't know uh, what you all came up with for this, but it, I think it really depends on, uh, on the type of love, obviously. You know, it, it, as we mentioned, there's different types of love, and, and we recognize that, uh, even though we may not have different words for that. Um, but uh, but 
that, that type of or that love has a different impact on people depending on what type of, of love it is. But let's just focus on agape love specifically since that's the one that's really in view when we're talking about God's love for us. When we talk about agape love, it is the love that God has shown to us. It's a giving love. It's a love that gives without expecting anything in return. It's selfless. Um, that type of love, what impact do we, would we say that that has? Well, I think that what agape love does is it ascribes value to a person. So if I'm the recipient of agape love, uh, it, 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 it's it's a type of love that lets me know that I have worth, that I have value, that I am um, that I I am important, and I don't mean that in a in a uh, a way to say that makes me better than other people. I mean that makes it, it, it ascribes worth to me, and so when we experience agape love, uh, that is an instance where we are experiencing uh, value being placed on us, or somebody in emphasizing to us that we are valued, that we are important, that we are uh, are loved, uh, that we are loved in that sense of that giving kind of love that ascribes value to us. So uh, that's, that's what I would say as far as uh, the impact love has. And of course, after, after a person experiences that, there's all kinds of reactions to that, that a person feels secure, a person feels uh, safe, a person feels valued, and and that they they uh, they matter. Uh, those are all expressions or realities that that happen as a result of experiencing agape love. Okay, well let's let's continue and, and go a little bit deeper on this topic, and uh, we're going to go to the uh, Hebrew uh, he, the Hebrew Bible here today for this, um, and we're going to look at a psalm, one of my favorite psalms of all. And, and, and in that psalm, I think we're going to discover something about God's love for us. That uh, it, it's not so much that it, it states God's love, but it explains God's love. And so that is Psalm 139 is where we're going to be today. Psalm 139. Take a moment. Read that psalm in a couple. Uh, well, you can read in a couple of versions. It is a little, not a terribly long psalm. You can probably pull that off. It's uh, just uh, 24 verses. But... Take a moment, read that as a group, uh, read through it individually, and uh, pause the video here, and then we'll be back in a minute. Okay, let me read Psalm 139. This is so, so good here. Um, it says, uh, Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me be night, even the darkness uh, is not dark to you, for the night is as bright as the day and darkness is as light with you. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when there as yet was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they were more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! The O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me or try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. There's so much in there uh, to talk about. But, uh, let, me, let me start with this question. What strikes you about God from this passage? What strikes you about God from this passage? Take a moment. 
and and uh, share that with each other. Take a moment and think through that, write some things down, and uh, pause the video here, and we'll be back in a minute. Okay, uh, you know, I, I think there's so much that you can glean from here, but what I, uh, what I really pick up from this psalm, probably more than anything else, is God's nearness, number one, and, and number two, his intimate care for uh, his children. Um, you know, it is just, it is just remarkable that the, the, the psalmist goes into such detail to talk about how close God is, how near he is, how, uh, how, how, uh, how, 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 uh, how close he is to each one of us as, as his children, that he's just right there. You can't escape. He's inescapable. He's, he's here. He's in front of us. He's behind us. He's at the sides of us. He's above us. He's below us. He's everywhere we could go. And uh, he's right there. He's closer, closer than any person could be. And then he, he says that it, it not only is, is that the case, but he says that there's the, this intimate care that God expresses toward us that we're the object is his children of intimate, intimate care, that he is looking after us, that he talks about forming us in mother's womb, and then all through life guiding us and leading us as his children, as those who've um, come to place their faith in him. Uh, it, it's just this remarkable, remarkable picture of how close God is to uh, to us, to, to his children. And so, uh, I, I think that's probably the thing that strikes me, and maybe there's something else that that struck you even even more uh, more poignantly in this in this psalm. But I think that is probably the things that that stick out to me more than anything else is how close God is, and also His uh, intimate care. Uh, those are things that that stand out to me from Psalm one nine one thirty nine. Second question here, what difference should it make that God is intimately acquainted with our ways? And why does this matter? Let me ask that again. What difference does, should it make that God is intimately acquainted with our ways? Why does this matter? Take a moment, pause the video here, discuss that, write, write down some thoughts. Okay, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think the thing that that, that really comes across to me when we talk about the difference here, uh, when I think about this personally, is, uh, you know, first of all, you know, you've been in contexts where you are nothing but a number, maybe at a, at a college or uh, in, a, in an office of some kind, and, and you're really just a number. There's no, uh, nothing personal that you're not, you're not recognized as a person, recognized for your intrinsic value. You're just, you're just a number on a paper somewhere or in a computer somewhere. Well, we're not that in regard to God. Uh, from this psalm, it's very clear that we are deeply and dearly loved and that he is, uh, has a personal interest in every one of us. Um, we're not forgotten. That's another big piece of this. That sometimes we think that we're forgotten by God or that God has um, gone off somewhere and just we're not even on his radar. This psalm dispels that permanently. This psalm tells us that we are always on God's radar because he's always close at hand. He's always right there. And so um, God, uh, you know, the question here, why does, why does this matter? Well, God loves us despite our, our sin. You know, sometimes we think, well, we sinned and then God is done with us. Well, that's not the case. And he, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, recognition that God is near us and his intimate concern for us tells us that he is, no matter based on our performance or anything, it, it, he is always there and he always loves us. His love is secure, it's steady, uh, it, it's, it's trustworthy, it's something we can bank on. But his nearness also, I think, tells us here, that what matters here is that, that his nearness tells us that we should want to avoid sinning against him because he's near to us, he's close to us. And uh, because of that, that drives us to uh, want to avoid doing something that was offensive to this one or something hurtful to this one who loves us so, so dearly. So I think those are just a couple of little uh, thoughts there with regard to uh, the difference that it makes that God is intimately acquainted with our ways. Next question here. God's perpetual nearness is a theme in this psalm. How is that a comfort and how does this help with 
insecurity. If you have feelings of insecurity, how does that help? So a uh, couple questions there. God's perpetual nearness is a theme in the psalm. How is this a comfort? And how does this help with insecurity? Take a moment, pause the video, and uh, see what you come up with for this one. Okay. Um, you know, nothing to ha happens to us from this. Um, this psalm, nothing, this psalm tells us um, with regard to his nearness to us, there's comfort there because this psalm tells us that there is nothing that happens to us outside of God's perfect presence and control. If, outside of God's presence and control, anything that happens to us in life, doesn't matter what it is, uh, it, it is always within God's purview. It's always within uh, his nearness and the context of his nearness, his proximity to us. And not only his proximity to us, but his control over the situation. And so he is, it's not like there's an emergency in it from God's perspective. He saw it coming. He knew it was happening. And when we have something that happens in our lives, um, that he, we recognize that he is in control, that he is present, that he knows what's going on, and that he's right there with us. And so when we know that, that's a, that's a, that's a huge, huge help. Uh, to recognize that God's love is secure. God, God is, uh, God's love anchors us in these storms that come through life. When, when things hit us that are, that are difficult, that are bad, that are hardships, that are, uh, shake us to our core. When these things happen, this truth that God is near, that he's in control, that he loves us, uh, these are the, these are the cords that anchor us, that keep us from, uh, from, from drifting away and from, from losing our uh, our sense of uh, of who we are and, and of what our value is because we recognize that no matter what comes at us God is still in control and we can we can trust him through that um, God's perpetual nearness there is is something that brings us uh, the comforting reality that nothing happens to us that's outside of his presence and outside of his control next question here God's love in this psalm is evident despite God's perfect knowledge of all we will do. How does this certain stable love encourage you? Let me read that again. God's love in this psalm is evident despite God's perfect knowledge of all we will do. How does this certain stable love encourage you? Now take a moment, uh, pause the video, discuss that, see what you come up with. Well, you know, uh, one thing that is is a, a verse that it, or an, a truth that is mentioned a couple times in scripture it's mentioned in i think deuteronomy uh back there and then it's mentioned also all the way here in the the book of uh, hebrews in the new testament it's quoted there and probably some other places but it's it's a wonderful wonderful truth and it's this that god has said never will i leave you never will i forsake you now that is that is huge and that is really 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 wonderful if you think about it god never will i leave you never will i forsake you um so you can go into your day i can go into my day knowing that god loves me fully that he loves me completely you can go into your day knowing that god loves you fully that god loves you completely knowing that he knows you fully, that he knows me fully, and yet loves you and I completely. Now that is astounding. That's, that's a, because you know, uh, sometimes we're afraid to let people know all about us or, or some of our failures and some of our uh, darker parts of our life because we are afraid of rejection. Well, you know, the wonderful liberating thing about this psalm tell, is that it tells us that God knows us completely. There are no corners of our life that God does not inspect, that he is not fully familiar with, the good, bad, and the ugly, and yet he still loves us. Now, that's not an excuse to, to keep the cobwebs in those corners, but uh, rather his intimate love for us and his knowledge of us should drive us to want to clean those corners out and to to, uh, to to honor him with 
with all that we are, but that love is there regardless for us. He knows us fully, yet he loves us fully. All right, last question here. When you feel insecure, how does God's careful creation of you give you strength? Let me say that again. When you feel insecure uh, or unloved, we might say, how does God's careful creation of you in verses 13 through 16 give you strength? Pause the video here, discuss that, see what you come up with. Take a moment and uh, think through that. Okay, uh, you know, I, I think that we're uniquely, we are uniquely designed by God. That is so clear here because 13 through uh, 16, let me read that to you. 13 through 16 says you're, uh, well, helps if I read the right sound. Um, 13 through 16, you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Uh, that just uh, is, is an incredible picture of God's um, careful fashioning of us and who we are, and that includes our not only our physical characteristics, but our personalities, everything that... that makes us who we are, that we were uniquely designed by God. Um, even our flaws, listen to this, even our thought flaws are features in this way of thinking because even our flaws give him purpose and pleasure and he has a purpose for even the things that we may wish were different about ourselves. I mean, the things that are, are, are just characteristics that we have that maybe we struggle with, whether they're personality characteristics or physical characteristics, even those things that we struggle with, that we have a difficult time with, that um, we wish were different. When we recognize that God has created us with those things, um, that makes those things not flaws but features, I think, because it helps us to recognize that those are unique, uniquely uh, designed aspects of who we are that are designed by God. And not only is that the case, but that he has a purpose for those things. And he had a purpose for, for including those things in, in us. And so uh, they can be used for his glory, even our, our weaknesses and our, our struggles. Those are places where he can be glorified. Well, I hope that you maybe can spend some time in Psalm 139, especially in those times when you're feeling uh, like you're not valued, like you're not important, or maybe especially when God, you think that God has forgotten you, that you're not under his radar, that he doesn't care. Uh, Psalm 139 is an incredible, incredible uh, antidote to those kind of that kind of thinking. And so I invite you and encourage you to spend a lot of time on Psalm 139, and you will find, uh, I hope, comfort in there like I have in times when I'm feeling uh, down on myself and not too good about what's going on to recognize that there's a God who knows me fully and loves me fully. Let me pray for you and pray for us. Father, thank you for this psalm. Thank you for Psalm 139. Uh, it's almost too good to be true to think the creator of all, the God of all creation, would uh, come along and say to us that you have created us for your glory in a unique way, personally fashioned us, and that you have purposes for us that we don't understand, that you're always with us, that you know us fully and love us fully. Remind us of these things, Father. Let us find our security and hope in who you are. Help us to trust you in the hard times. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Savior you gave. And it's in his wonderful name I ask it. Amen. Well, I hope you have a wonderful week, and thank you for uh, spending this time with me. I hope that Psalm 139 is an encouragement to you as we think about this topic of God's love and as we face the challenges of life. Uh, love you all. Have a good week. See you later. Bye-bye.